Hey everybody, good morning and welcome to EAG Church Online. My name is John and we are so delighted to have you joining us today. Hey, if you've just come in from the cold, why don't you leave us a comment telling us who you're watching with and where you're watching from? Or if you have something more personal and serious that you would like to share with us, you can put that in the comments as well. Or you can message us privately, either through social media or our website, www.eagrm.org. Just drop us a line and we'll get in touch with you right away. Now it's just about time for Sunday morning to get started. So if you haven't already, and maybe you have, now is the perfect time to get a Bible in one hand and some nice Christmas cocoa in the other as we get ready for another amazing morning of E8. Let's try that again. So if you haven't already, now is the perfect time to get a Bible in one hand and a nice Christmas cocoa in the other as we get ready for another terrific morning of online church. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing this old carol together. The first Noel. Talking about the first night that people found out about the Savior. Sing together. The first Noel the angel did sing was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep Noel, 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 Noel Born is the King of Israel Alright, take a deep breath and let's get ready for the second verse they look it up and saw a star shining in the east beyond them far. And to the earth it gave great light, and so it continued both Celebrate our saving God today. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Let's sing that again in the name, in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your 
saints bow down as your people sing. We will rise with you lifted on your wings. everybody. I hope that your Christmas season is going well, whether it's warm or cold where you are. Uh, it is Christmas season, and so that's so awesome as we, as we think about all the preparation that it takes for all of us, you know, to just decorate, to get gifts and that, and it's a blessing. But, but most importantly, when I think of this time of year, I think about children. You know, children are so uh, precious. You know, they're so excited. Nancy and I got to see a couple of our granddaughters do their little Christmas dance we saw the other day, and it's cute, and it's wonderful, and so we're, we're happy to see that. And so there's a lot of things with kids, and I know that uh, I was reading some of the children's letters uh, that I read in a story about letters that they wrote to Santa, and there were two or three that, that, that just stuck out, just, just thinking about how kids think. And one of them said, Dear Santa, you didn't bring me anything good last year. In fact, you didn't bring me anything good last year. This is your last chance, signed Albert. Here's another one. It said, Dear Santa, there are three little boys who live at our house. There's Jeffrey, who's two, and David, who's four, and there's Norman, who's seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time, David is good most of the time, and Norman is good all the time. I'm Norman. Well, the truth is that none of us are good all the time. In fact, the Bible says that's why we have Christmas, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we, we see in Matthew 1, 21, where the angel says to Joseph in a dream that you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, we pick up today 
uh, with part three of our four-part Fear Not series at Christmas. And we look at the four times in the Christmas story where some of the key folks are told to fear not, to not be afraid. And we know, we all know that fear is a real thing. It's something that we all experience. In fact, doctors have identified over 700 phobias or fears. Fear is something we deal with no matter how old we are, what we've been through in this life, what stage of life we're in. Children have this fear of being alone. Adolescents have a fear of rejecting. Young adults have a fear of failure. Older adults have a fear of death or, or life without meaning. And it's true that when fear consumes us and controls us, we become defeated and we, we don't really live the abundant Christian life that God has planned for us. In fact, I love what the psalmist David said, who faced a lot of fear and challenges in his life. He said, I sought the Lord. And he answered me and he rescued me or delivered me, whatever ver version you read, from all my fears. And, and as we begin this message today and as it goes along with this series, that's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to rescue us. He wants to deliver us from all of our fears. Now, in week one, it was when the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah while he's preparing the incense in the temple of the Lord. And in Luke 1 13, the angel says, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him John. And my message that week was fear not, just believe. Zachariah, just believe the word of the Lord. And what I spoke about on that is, is when God answers our prayer, you know, it's not always just exactly what we ask for. There's a lot of moving parts involved in that answer to prayer. They wanted a son. But there's a big responsibility of having a baby. They probably expected that, that he would be in the temple and, and serve alongside them or take their place. They didn't realize he'd be an itinerant preacher out there in the wilderness, you know, preparing the way of the Lord. Last week, we looked at Luke 1.30, where uh, Gabriel said, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And my theme last week was fear not, just trust. And we looked at how Mary just had to trust God for all these amazing things that Gabriel was telling her that was going to happen. And then finally, she comes to the realization of this in Luke 1, 38 and 39. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Now this week, we're going to look at Joseph's story. So if you'll go with me, we're going to go now from Luke and we're going to go back to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, because uh, this is where Joseph, we find him. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so there's that fear not for today. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So that was the fear Joseph had to deal with. And so we'll, we're going to unpack that here today. Just on a, on a funny note, a lady told her husband that she had dreamed that he had bought her a diamond necklace for Christmas. The husband responded positively to her dream by bringing her a beautifully wrapped present. As she eagerly tore open the wrapping to see her diamond necklace, all she found was a bo little book entitled, How to Interpret Your Dreams. Well, Joseph's response to all the dreams that he had in his life was the same, obedience. The title of today's message is Fear Not. Just obey. So let's pray and get ready to receive this. Father, this is your holy word. Father, this is the third occasion where we see an angel just saying, fear not, Lord. We, we see it to Zechariah. We see it to Mary. Now to Joseph. God, there was a lot of fear at that first Christmas because everything was taking place in a way that had never happened before. And God, that's our life sometimes. We, we face circumstances, whether they're good or bad, that we've never experienced before. And there's a little bit of fear with that because we don't know where it's going to lead or what's going to happen. And Father, I believe today that your message for us is that we don't need to fear. We just need to obey you, whether we understand what's happening or not. Lord, the safest place for us to be is in the middle of your will, which we can only be there if we trust and obey you. So help us today. Speak to every one of our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. 
Now, you know, you can step back and you can say a lot of things about Christmas, but sometimes you think it begins like a lot of other romantic stories. Of course, there's a damsel in distress. In this case, it's a teenage Jewish girl named Mary, who we, who we talked a lot about last week. She's engaged to be married, uh, but she's pregnant, but not by her fiancé. And if, and if you've ever shared her testimony, you know that the testimony begins with the word test. Except we don't call it a test, we call it trouble, because we're in trouble. Mary's in trouble. She's not much different than any other teenager that's ever lived. In fact, it appears that she must not be able to feel safe in her community or talk to her parents. So in the whole biblical story, she goes to see uh, her relative Elizabeth, who is also miraculously pregnant in her own age. And then shortly after that, as we come to Matthew now, enter the knight in shining armor, Joseph. Okay? Joseph gets left out of many Christmas messages. It's kind of like men at a wedding, right? Have you ever noticed how unnecessary men are at a wedding? The ladies have on their beautiful dresses and the flowers and the newspaper tells you all about the bride and who made her dress and everything about the gown and, and, and the bridesmaids, what they're wearing. It never tells you how the men are dressed. And I've been to many weddings and uh, proceeded over many weddings. And men dress all kind of different ways from, from jeans and suspenders to just the best tuxedos you can afford. Speaking of weddings, I heard about a 90-year-old man who went to the doctor. The doctor did a complete physical on him. And then after the physical, he sat down with him and talked to him about the report. The 90-year-old man listened. He nodded, shook his head, thanked the doctor, and went on his way. A week or so later, the doctor and his wife happen to be at a wedding. He's eating dinner, and he sees out on the dance floor this same 90-year-old man cutting it up with a 30-year-old blonde beauty, and it's just like, you, who does this guy think he is? And after the song was over, he pulls him off to the side. And he says, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just doing what you told me, doc. He said, well, what did you hear me tell you? He said, well, you told me to get a hot mama and be cheerful. The doc said, no, I didn't tell you that. I told you, you have a heart murmur, so be careful. Now, surprisingly, <clears throat> Joseph does not say one word in all the scripture narrative. Angels speak. Mary has a conversation with Gabriel and sings a praiseful solo. Wise men talk to Herod and worship the newborn king. Shepherds talk to angels and preach the good news. Joseph is silent. There's no sound bites, no quotes, no words of wisdom. We find him just listening, trusting, and most importantly, you're going to find in his story, he just obeys the word of the Lord. We assume he speaks because we can imagine him, you know, having conversations with Mary about all of this that's happening, maybe about her parents and his parents. We can picture him talking to the innkeeper, the shepherds, the wise men, all of them, but none of that conversation is in Scripture. The Holy Spirit chose not to give us a single word of Joseph in Scripture. <coughs> we know he's a carpenter by trade. He makes things fit together. You know, he's learned how to measure twice so that he cuts only once. He's not used to surprises because when he builds anything or does construction, he always has some kind of blueprint or building plan before he proceeds. So in Act 1 of God's redemption plan, he's caught, like Mary, between what God says and what makes sense. Have you ever been there? Has there been times in your life when you've questioned God's plans? Or, or the circumstances in your life, and you say, how can God orchestrate this? What, what in the world is going on? So even though Joseph doesn't say anything, there are a lot of things we can say about Joseph. So go with me to Matthew 1, 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or pledged to marry Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, at first sight, this, this might be a little bit confusing to some of you because in verse 18, it tells us that he's betrothed or he's engaged to marry. Then in verse 19, he tells us he's thinking about divorcing her. And then in verse 20, she is called his wife. So Jewish marriage was a three-step process. First, there was the engagement stage. This was the contractual stage between both sets of parents, that they, the arrangement for these two to be married. 
The second, second stage was called the betrothal stage. This would be equivalent to our engagement. It lasted only about a year, and it was a bridal uh, binding contract that could only be dissolved by death or by divorce. This is where we find Mary and Joseph in the story. And it's during this stage they were married in, a, in every way except sexually. Then would come the marriage itself where they would enjoy, you know, a, a, a marriage as we know marriage. Now Joseph, we find here, has a real problem on his hands. He has a young teenage fiance who's pregnant, but it's not by him. So there's this big time tension that's going on in Joseph's life. And the tension is between the love that he has for her and, you know, what his plans are and the tension between what the law says. On one hand, he knew exactly what the law said, that if a man found his wife to be was unfaithful, he could make a public disgrace of her or, or he could put her away privately. He, he could even have her put to death. On the other hand, this is the love of his life. At this point, Joseph has some doubts. He doubts Mary. He, he doubts her character. He doubts her purity, her virginity. Obviously, you know, she's pregnant. How can she still be a virgin? He doubts God because even though Mary by now had told him how all of this happened, you know, this has never happened in the history of the world. There's no place of this in the scripture anywhere. So, so he, he doubts all this. He didn't believe how it could happen. Then he doubts himself because he didn't know what to do. Well, verse 19 says this. And Joseph, her husband... Being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away quietly. I love this about Joseph. It gives us a glimpse into his character because most people, when they find themselves in a difficult situation, they think, how is this going to affect me? Am I going to look bad in the community? Are people going to think bad about me? But he, he's not thinking like that. He's mostly concerned about how this will affect Mary, the person that he loves. And I think in our world, if we would think in these terms, how much better the world would be if we're concerned about the other people and what they're going through. See, Joseph did something we should always do. We're in the middle of a situation where we don't know what to do. We should pray. And we should pray. And we should pray until we get an answer from the Lord. Well, it says here, but when he had considered this, in other words, he's prayed about this, he's thought about this, he's coming up with a plan. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, Joseph was a descendant of King David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Well, why would anybody be afraid to take the love of their life as their wife? Well, in Joseph's case, she's already pregnant. She's, she's told this story about the Holy Spirit being the father. But, and, then, and so the angel goes on to say, For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. What she says is true, Joseph. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So God intervenes and gives him the whole plan. Matthew then gives the explanation of, of why God was doing this. Verse 22, now all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. I've said this many times in Christmas messages, but just so you know, this word fulfill is a key word in the Gospel of Matthew. It shows up about 15 times, and the reason is, is the Gospel of Matthew is primarily written to the Jewish people. And, and so Matthew uses that word to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. So that God is keeping his promise here, the Messiah has come. Then we read in verses 24 and 25 these words. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. So, so there's no, no, no questioning here. There, there, there's no hem and hawing. There's no you know, thinking anymore. He, he awoke from and he did. That, that's called obedience. And he took Mary as his wife and kept her a virgin, hello, until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. D do you know Why? that Joseph both married her and kept her virgin until after Jesus was born, because that was God's plan. That's how it had to be. And so Joseph was willing to go with exactly what God wanted to be done. Joseph, he gives us this lesson in obedience. Well, <clears throat> if you are in the middle of a situation right now in your life where you doubt whether or not you can make it. You, you doubt whether or not you can keep on going or you doubt whether or not you can survive. Learn this lesson from Joseph. Obey even if you don't understand what God is saying. Obey if you don't even fully know what the word says. Obey if it doesn't make sense. So here's what we know about Joseph. Okay? Joseph, first of all, was righteous in his walk with God. The Bible just says this. Verse 19 says, And Joseph, being a righteous man, 
a good man, a godly man, a, a guy that followed the Bible, a man that he did not want to disgrace her, desire to put her away sacredly. So that was his, he wasn't going to have her a stone, wasn't going to make a big public spectacle. She was just gonna, he was just going to try to, you know, move her off, you know, into the distance the best he could, trying to keep her integrity and, and just keep her safe. And before he had a clear word from the Lord, he's already pondering in his mind, how, how can I help this person that I love? Mary's pregnant. Joseph is troubled. He's confused. But the righteousness of Joseph caused him to do a couple things. Number one, he treated Mary very well. We see that here. He wanted to put her away privately. He could have disgraced her. He could have publicly been the catalyst in taking her life. And do you begin to see how important Joseph is in the Christmas story? We talk a lot about Mary and Gabriel shows up a lot and the shepherds and the wise men and all of this. But, but a lot hinges on Joseph's decision just to obey God in every step of the journey here. He was a righteous man not only because he treated her well, but he, he did not break God's law. Even though she had perhaps been unfaithful, he still not, doesn't really know. He's just trusting God. He wanted to treat her well. He could have had at that moment said, everybody's going to think that the baby is mine and, and anyway, so I might as well go ahead and have sexual relations with her. But, but he didn't do that. He said, no, God's way is the right way. I'm going to marry her and I'm going to keep her a virgin until this baby is born. And let, me, and let me just throw in a little life application that I've thrown in talking about Joseph before, is that the people closest to us most often test our relationship with God the most, don't they? People closest to us, they test our relationship with God the most. They challenge us the most. Because we're, we sometimes have to love people in our life that are not very loving. We have to love people in our life that maybe have treated us the wrong way. You know, we, we've got, you know, the scripture, the Bible, living for God, if it makes sense, it makes sense in our everyday life, okay? So this is true in Joseph's life with Mary. He loves her. He longs for the day when they're going to be fully married. And suddenly this blows up in his face. And yet he obeys God because he was a righteous man. We see that Joseph was inwardly strong and courageous. God's word for that description is meek. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness toward God is that disposition of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good without disputing or re resisting or whining. We, we, we just, you know, we just trust God. We just obey him if it's up to us. And so when something goes wrong, the first reaction of most people have is how will this affect me? But Joseph's reaction is how this is going to affect Mary and I want to do what's right for her. I, I say we need to adopt that in our life. See, nothing is more revealing about our maturity than the way we respond to difficult situations. We, will we react in self-defense or self-preservation or, or in love and trust and kindness and forgiveness and obedience? Joseph's love for Mary reflects Paul's definition in 1 Corinthians 13 about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not proud or rude. Love is not self-seeking. Or easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Young ladies that aren't married, I would say find a Joseph to marry in your life. Someone that has a characteristic of this man in the Bible. That, that has real love and not just a, a superficial love. Joseph was righteous in his walk, but secondly, he was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I say that in terms that we understand as Christians nowadays, but, but what he was sensitive to was, was everything the angel said to him in a dream or, or however God was talking to him. By the time you get to the first part of verse 20, God hasn't spoken to him yet, but he's already made the best plan that he could to put Mary away privately. But verse 20 says, and when he considered this, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. I'm amazed at the receptivity of Joseph at this point. It's hard to hear from God when you might be angry. Or, or emotional or confused, which, which Joseph was probably all of this to some degree. In fact, it's difficult for us to listen and be sensitive to the Spirit when we've already made our own plans.
Right? We do that sometimes. Or it's hard to be sensitive to spirit when we are overly emotional about the problem, where we're not listening, just our emotions are banging in our head. You know, we're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit when risk is involved. You know, when the Holy Spirit wants to gently tell us the right way, but it might seem risky, but we might not want to go in that direction. It, it's, di it's difficult to be sensitive to the Spirit when God's plan doesn't make sense, and sometimes it doesn't. In their life it didn't, in our life sometimes it doesn't. It's hard to be sensitive to the Spirit when we fear what other people might think or say. All of these things are true. All of these things were happening in Joseph's life. I can promise you that. And when we cry out like Joseph, God, how can this be? We, we better be still long enough to hear the still, quiet voice of the Holy Spirit come to us and say, this is the way, walk in it. That's what's happening here. Jo Joseph had a dream, but, but you and I have the benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit who leads us in the way of righteousness. See, Joseph didn't know everything, but he did what he knew. He did what the angel told him to do. And you and I don't have to know everything to obey God and what he's asking us to do. Do what you know to do. Do what the Bible says to do. Start from there until the Lord or the Spirit gives you different directions. Joseph was righteous in his walk, sensitive to the Spirit. And thirdly, what, what our main message is, he was complete in his obedience to God. Complete. He was immediate in his obedience. There are four times in the scriptures that we find God interacting with Joseph through a dream. And all four times, complete obedience is the immediate response of Joseph. Can I say that again? Immediate response. Joseph took, his, took Mary as his wife as the first one. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. There it is, immediate obedience. Secondly, we, we see that they fled to Egypt. In Matthew 2, we're going down to verses 13 through 50 now. When they had gone, meaning the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up. You know, we usually dream it in the middle of the night, right? So, so he's in bed, he's sleeping. But in this dream, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. We don't know which angel this time. It says an angel of the Lord. Get up. He said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night. He left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophets. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Thirdly, he returned back from Egypt, back to Israel. We're still in Matthew chapter 2. Now we're at verse 19. After Herod died... Here it is again. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life for dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. You, you see the immediate, complete obedience immediately, middle of the night, whenever it was. He gets up, packs his bags, and here they go. And then fourthly, he went to Nazareth. In Matthew 20. Verse 22 and 23 of chapter 2. And being warned by God in a dream, he departed to the regions of Galilee. In other words, he just didn't go back anywhere in Israel. He went specifically to the regions of Galilee. Because if you read the couple verses before that, there was some other leader that, that might be dangerous. And so being warned in that dream, they went to the regions of Galilee. Obedience meant risk for Joseph. And it means that for us, doesn't it? It means the same. That's what faith is. It's learning to trust and obey. You know, you ever remember, you remember growing up as a kid and maybe, maybe your parents told you to do something and, and you, your response was, why? You know, especially when you're a young teenager or, or getting to be an older kid, parents tell you to do something, you say, why? You ever get that answer from your parents where it's not a real answer, they said, because I told you so, that's why. And I know as a parent, I've probably said that a time or two to my kids, you know, they, they say, well, I said, because I'm telling you, just do it, you know. And maybe it's because there's no good answer that they will accept, or maybe it's because you don't know what to tell them at that moment. You just need them to obey. But we, we don't see Joseph here. He's a righteous man, remember. So we don't see him fighting back or questioning God. We, we just see when he hears the word of the Lord, you know, he's up and he's doing it. So when we, when we look at this, you know, the, uh, uh, just the summary of all this, we see Joseph obeying God in the middle of doubt. 
Okay, if you look at all the scenarios, we, we see that he obeyed God in the middle of danger. You know, he, he just trusted God knew the best path to keep them safe. He obeyed God in the middle of difficulty. And I'm telling you, you folks, there are times when God's will is not the easiest thing to do. There are times when God's will is not the most convenient thing to do. It's not the thing that you want to do. It's not the thing that will feel right to do. There are times when, when things are not turning out the way we plan. But I'm telling you, don't let doubt, don't let danger, don't let difficulty or confusion disrupt or keep you from just obeying God. You know, it's like that old song that they used to sing growing up, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but just to trust and obey. So I'm telling you that God's way is not always the safest way, but God is the surest way to be in that place where he can bless you, where he can protect you, where he can watch over you, where you can be in the middle of his will. So what's the takeaway for us as we think about Joseph? We, we don't know what's coming around the corner. You know, as I'm giving this message just a few days ago, there were horrendous tornadoes that went through Kentucky. Dozens and dozens of people killed. Still others are missing at this point. And I think that, that's, that, that's a terrible tragedy in itself. And we know we add to that tragedy that it's right before Christmas. And why, why is it a more tragedy around Christmas? Because Christmas is about family. Christmas is about, you know, people wanting to go home and be with family and just relax and, 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 and enjoy the preciousness that we have. See, we don't know what's going to happen. And there are going to be many, many things in our life that we endure that don't make sense. We may never understand some things we've gone through until we get to heaven one day. And, and God reveals it if he wants to. So in difficult moments, rather than try to answer unanswerable questions, we do better just to trust God and just obey where he's leading us and just believe what we should believe about God, that he's loving, that he's kind, that everything he does is, is right. He doesn't make mistakes, that all things will work together for those that love him. We, we just need to trust and obey. See, sometimes, though, we operate under the assumption that if we are obedient, that everything's going to be fine. And, and so I don't want to rain in your parade here, but that's not always the way it works. The Old Testament Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was falsely accused by, by, by his master Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. Daniel was obedient, did everything right, was as godly as can be, but was thrown to the lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were obedient, but yet they were thrown in the furnace. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, you know, there, there's scriptures that talk about everything that's happened to this guy. Yeah, we know at the beginning he was against the church and against Christ. He has this miraculous transformation on the road to Damascus, a save filled with the Holy Holy Spirit, and no one was like Paul. He was tireless in his three missionaries' journeys, going wherever he could, but he spent most of his time in prison. You know, he, he was beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, stoned, you name it, happened to this guy. But he was obedient to the call of God. In all those situations, though, God was with them. And the bottom line is that as, as we walk in obedience to the Lord and what he's calling us to do, he'll be with us. He was with Joseph and Mary. Nothing happened to them well, as long as Joseph was getting up and going where they said. They were safe. They were fine. And you think of all the trust that God had in this one earthly man to be, you know, the, the human father of Jesus. But God could trust him because he was a righteous man. Jesus said, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. I wonder today, what is it God is calling you to do? What it is that you might be afraid of that if you step out in obedience in that direction? What, what makes you afraid? Maybe it's the first point of obedience that, uh, that you need to be baptized in water or, or you need to believe God for the baptism in the Holy Spirit or, or, or maybe you're struggling with issues in your life or direction in your life. You know, don't let fear keep you back from obedience. Don't let doubt keep you back from obedience. You know, maybe there are areas of integrity. It doesn't matter. So I'm challenging you today in this message, and it's not me only, but it's the Holy Spirit, I believe, just as God's messenger challenged Joseph, fear not, just obey, just obey, trust and obey the word of the Lord. Father, I, I thank you for your word this morning, that, that, that it's good, that it's righteous, that it speaks life to us, God. And I know that we, we, we Lord, we're adults and we, we're wise in a lot of things. We think we know stuff, but God, there are some things in life we don't know. There are, there are some intersections we come in life, we don't know which road will be best. It seems like there's a road that seems like it will be the best, but there's, Lord, it might not be. 
And Father, there are those occasions that we just need to learn to not be afraid, but just to obey you, to just to trust that you have our best interest in your mind, and you do. And you promise, Lord, to never leave us or forsake us, but to walk with us through all the days of our life. So Lord, I pray for those that are a little bit timid right now, a little bit afraid or whatever, that they can just find it in their heart to obey the word of the Lord, to obey the leading of your Holy Spirit, to just step out in those areas where you want to bless them beyond what they can think or imagine. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. Well, once again, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. If you would like to find out more about EAG, who we are and what we do, then make sure to connect with us at these social media links down below. You can also go to our website, www.eagrm.org. We would love to hear from you and get you plugged in with our church family. Now that's all the time that we have for this Sunday, but make sure to join us again, same place, same time next Sunday, as we come back together for our last online Sunday of 2021. We look forward to seeing you there. And so, until we meet again, stay safe, take care, and God bless. Merry Christmas, everybody!